Hey, it's Rebecca here. Um, I thought I'd do a quick rerun of a presentation I did at Craig Payne's um, Podiatry Fireside Summit. In this little presentation, I drew some parallels between blisters, calluses and ulcers because they're all caused by the same thing. Um, but when we think of blisters, we just think of heat, moisture and friction. But that doesn't cause blisters. And when we think about what causes calluses, all we think about is pressure. But that's not the whole story. And when we think about what causes ulcers, we're always thinking neuropathy and ischemia. What causes blisters, calluses and ulcers is shear stresses. So what is shear? Because, you know, to me, shear used to be a rather abstract concept. I mean, I could rattle off a definition, but I didn't really get it. Uh, and, and really, shear is just this. It's the give in the soft tissue. To understand why we get shear, you just need to remember that the foot, when we walk, it doesn't function like a block of wood. So from heel strike to toe off, things move around in there. The bones move and the soft tissues, they move back and forth. To get shear, we need bones moving one way and the force of friction, which acts the other way. And shear is what happens to everything in between. So for simplicity's sake, let's think about a barefoot heel strike. Heel hits the ground, the force of friction keeps the skin surface stuck to the floor. Momentum means that the bones are moving forward and everything in between that can, can give, it does give. So see that it's skin stays stuck, bones move forward and everything in between stretches. Doug Ritchie put it really well in his 2010 blister paper. He described shear as the skin and the bones moving out of sync with one another. And I really like that definition. And that's what he's describing. Skin stays stuck, bones move forward, and everything in between stretches. Now, just as we know that the foot isn't a, doesn't function like a block of wood, it's also not a loose bag of tissue. So you can't just open it up, pluck out each individual tissue because they're all structurally connected. And because they're structurally connected, that means there's a finite amount of shear that can happen before something gives, something breaks. And with blisters, that mechanical fatigue is in the stratum spinosum of the epidermis. There's a bit of a tear. Uh, within two hours, fluid fills that area and you've got a blister. It makes the, the fluid, makes the surface of the skin bubble up and that's what we recognise as a blister. With um, ulcers, it's the same thing. Now, I'm no expert on ulcer management or diabetes, but think about what diabetes does to uh, connective tissue. It makes it stiffer. So if it's stiffer, there's going to be less give in the soft tissue before something breaks. So the stress strain curve is going to be much steeper. And think about healed ulcer sites and scar tissue. It's very, very stiff skin. And in regard to calluses, while I'm not sure we would call calluses an injury of shear, they're definitely a lesion caused by shear stresses. Uh, Belinda Longhurst was on PodChat Live a little while ago, and she was discussing uh, Farina Hashmi and Chris Nestor's paper on hyperkeratotic skin. And she put it in really simple terms for us, where she said the shear stresses cause incomplete uh, skin cells. And because the nucleus is still there, apparently that's kind of sticky, and it makes all the skin cells stick together. So blisters, calluses and ulcers, they're all caused by shear stresses. So let's now have a look at this. This is shear. Let's have a look at the contributing factors and how we can vary them. Okay, let's first of all do pressure. If we press with really high force, there are bigger shear distortions. Now when we do this, we've got to keep our fingertip stuck to the same bit of skin. Okay, so big shear distortions. Now, if we press really lightly, I can only go to there before my fingertip wants to slide against the back of my hand and down to there. So understandably, lower pressure means lower shear distortions. Now let's vary friction levels. I've got some Aquaphor here. Aquaphor is just like Vaseline, really. <clears throat> we use some of that on the back of my hand. I'm gonna press really hard, even harder than before, like so hard that it hurts. And I can literally not hardly move my finger up at all or down 
before my fingertip wants to slide against the back of my hand. Okay, so we even in the presence of really, really high pressure, you can reduce shear distortions big time if you reduce friction levels. Now let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum and, and uh, presume that we're going to increase friction levels. Let's say we've been um, in our shoes and socks all day. We get home, we take them off, our skin's kind of sticky and clammy. <clears throat> or let's even take it further and, and say there's some tape residue stuck to our skin. So we are kind of artificially increase friction levels. Now you wouldn't have to hardly press at all and you would get big, big shear distortions in the back of your hand because we've increased friction levels. So this is why we um, manage friction levels to reduce these lesions of skin shear. <clears throat> and then we get on to bone movement. Uh, obviously, all things being equal, pressure and friction, uh, if, we, if the bones were just moving more in the foot, there'd obviously be bigger shear distortions. And you can think of ligamentous laxity. So if you can minimise friction levels, pressure and bone movement, you'll be going a long way to reducing the incidence of these skin shear lesions. <coughs> so let's take those three uh, contributing factors to shear and, and just talk about the specific uh, blister prevention strategies that we've got at our disposal. We've got donut pads. We've got cushioning like Spenko insoles and orthotic covers. We've got orthotics. Orthotics can definitely reduce pressure. We can wear thicker socks. We can get the right shoe fit. Obviously, if shoes are tighter, there's a higher contact pressure from the upper of the shoe. Um, and we can use toe devices to minimize, for example, the interdigital pressure because of the, the very close apposition of toes. <coughs> So that's pressure management strategies. Now let's look at friction management strategies. Well, you've seen how the Aquaphor or the Vaseline, so the greasy lubricant type of thing works. And you can also use dry lubricants like powders. So your starch and talc powders, they, uh, they absorb a bit of moisture to keep friction levels on the skin lower. And then there's something like two Tom's blister shield powder. It doesn't absorb moisture. It actually is made out of a low friction material called PTFE or polytetrafluoroethylene, and that's how it reduces friction levels. And that one's the pick of the bunch for me. Um, we've also got Engo patches. I really like these, they're made out of PTFE too. Um, now I sell these, so I have a benefit in telling you about these, so just keep that in mind. But the reason I like these is you can just target the high friction areas where it's a problem. See, the thing with <clears throat> Vaseline is athletes will usually put Vaseline all over their foot. Now, friction is actually a good thing. We need friction to get traction for our foot in our shoe. So if there's a severe lack of traction, our foot slides around, we're thinking black toenails, maybe blisters under the toenails, and also we're thinking about we're reducing the mechanical efficiencies of gait, aren't we? Like propulsive forces and braking forces. So reducing friction all over willy-nilly is not really the best way to go about it. And so targeting those high friction areas just where it's a problem, like just where, because we don't get blisters and calluses all over the foot, not at least at the start anyway. We just get them in kind of discrete locations. So I like to just manage friction at those areas and leave traction as is um, because really the rest of the foot can deal with it. Um, we've also got um, we've got the Vasily Armstrong device. It's a friction reduction strategy, um, and it is a friction reduction strategy because of this Teflon layer. Now, I suspect this is PTFE too, because that's what Teflon is, PTFE. Um, and what happens here is there's just easy movement to be had there, just for the forefoot area where the the, the um, Teflon layer is. So if you can imagine that your foot is sitting on the top there, the bones and the skin, they're not needed. There's less shear required because we've got this easy movement to happen between these material layers. So in that way, the skin and the bone are able to move more in sync with one another. <clears throat> 
And then <clears throat> when it comes to friction, we've also got double socks. Um, now imagine not wearing socks. So if you don't wear socks, you've got a skin shoe interface and the friction level will be what it will be. If you add a sock, so now we're wearing socks with our shoes, we've got a skin sock interface and a sock shoe interface. And one of those interfaces is gonna have a lower friction level, allowing that small early glide that we need to allow the skin and the bone to move more in sync. And then we can use double socks. So double socks introduce a third interface, a sock sock interface. Now you can just use any old double sock or two pairs of socks, but um, you can get really specific about the materials that you use and the best way um, or the best uh, sock that does that is Arma Skin Socks, A-R-M-A -A, Skin, or one word. Um, and they're made out of a really high friction, they're the inner sock, you just wear any outer sock you like. Um, they're made out of a material, the inner lining that goes against the skin is a really high friction level material, like so much so that you can't just pull the sock on, you've got to like roll it onto the foot. Um, and it has a, a relatively low friction level material for the outer surface of that inner sock. So you're guaranteed that there's going to be that small early movement uh, between the two sock layers. Now I'm a little bit dubious about armor skin socks because they reduce friction over the whole surface of the foot, like plantar and dorsal surface as well. And as I said, we actually rely on friction levels for the mechanical efficiencies of gait. So, um, but I know plenty of people that get on well with them. It's like everything, different people tolerate um, different things to different degrees. And then we've got bone movement strategies. Uh, so, Obviously, we can reduce bone movement with orthoses and all the prescription variables involved. We can reduce um, bone movement with stretches. Think about um, blisters at the back of the heel. So if that's your heel, you've got a blister at the back here, but the Achilles tendon inserts in the back. Now, if there's a lot of tension in the Achilles tendon, it's acting to pull the heel bone up higher and sooner, increasing shear distortion at the back of the heel. So for that, we could use calf stretches, we could use heel lifts, we could think about the heel height differential on the shoes, we could use MOBs, mobilise the lower tib fib joint. So that's pressure management strategies, friction management strategies and bone movement strategies. But there's two more I want to talk about um, before I finish up here and that is the first one is shear absorption. Now we can use materials that actually undergo shear themselves so the material gives um, and if we do that then there's less shear that's required within the skin so we can get shear absorption from cushioning materials like spenko and poron so there's actually giving that material yeah um, and the one that i really like for toe for uh, toe blisters is um, silicon gel toe sleeves i really love this material for the majority of toe blisters not all of them um, this material just absorbs so much here, it's not funny. So it's, it's great for the majority of toe blisters, but it's not just good for every area of the foot. Like if you had a big sheet of this stuff and had it as an insole, it would be ridiculous because your foot would be all slippy slidey in your shoe. There'd be no traction at all. And I mean, imagine trying to do a 100 meter sprint or like an obstacle course you'd just have no traction and you'd be inviting more troubles than you'd be solving. So that's shear absorption. And lastly um, is the, the way that I feel a podiatrist's favourite uh, blister prevention strategy works and that is tape. Now I don't believe taping reduces pressure. How can it? It's not really thick enough to cushion. I don't believe taping reduces friction levels. Now, I don't know that for sure because uh, tape companies don't, uh, don't publish their coefficient of friction data for tape. Um, but when you think about it, tape is made out of a similar sort of material as a shoe lining or a sock. I mean, not, not a similar material, but it kind of feels the same. Um, and when you think about it, Tape manufacturers aren't making tape to reduce blisters, they're making tape to deal with musculoskeletal injuries and they don't need to be reducing friction levels. In fact, they probably want friction to remain relatively the same. 
so I don't think it reduces pressure. I don't think taping reduces friction levels. I don't think taping reduces bone movement because when we use tape, we don't uh, use load eye, etc. Like we just lay tape on the foot. So I, don't, I can't see how it can reduce bone movement. I don't think it absorbs any shear because it's not really the right construction of material. The way I do think that tape works though is I feel that it um, it redistributes or it, it distributes shear load over a larger area. Now think about it, when we get a blister or something, uh, we, we just tape, we don't just tape there. Even though the blister is there, we don't just cut out a bit of tape and put it there. We put it across the whole ball of the foot. Now in doing so, instead of this happening, this is our shear, instead of that happening, we've got more of this happening. So by inflicting shear over a larger surface area, I feel that we are reducing it, at least reducing the peak level of shear at that problematic area. Now, you can't expect tape to reduce or to eliminate blisters altogether. And the fact is people do blister in spite of tape. And I'm an example of that. And that's possibly why I've really gone into figuring out how all these things work and how they don't work. But, you know, I still tell people to do taping, especially if they feel like they just need a little bit of uh, oomph in regard to blister management. Um, but if that doesn't work, I'm never surprised. I just move on to something a bit more, um, you know, like reducing friction, trying to reduce pressure better and um, bone movement, often with the use of orthotics, depending on where the blister location is. And that's the big thing is the one strategy doesn't work for every blister location. And I feel that uh, athletes and, and active people and anyone really, and podiatrists, need to start thinking about um, not only how prevention strategies work, but matching it to the anatomical location. So that's a bit of a, uh, a quick overall of how I feel blister prevention strategies work and also uh, how they relate to callus and ulcer management. Um, so just to recap, we've talked about what shear is. We've had a look at what it looks like and what it feels like, how you can reduce it, and the specific uh, prevention strategies that you can use. So if you've got any questions about that, don't hesitate to leave a comment below or get in touch with me and I'll be happy to help.